us pray. Good and gracious God, today we gather with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the others around the cross upon which Jesus dies, is crucified and dies, who carries upon his shoulders the weight of our sin, the weight of our brokenness, the weight of our pain, the weight of our fear and struggle. On this day, O oh God, a day that we call good, we thank you for your love for us, poured out for our sake in the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. From palms to passion, from shouts of Hosanna, save us, to cries of crucify him, crucify him. We have experienced the, high, the heights and the depths, the mountains and the valleys of life in this season of Lent. We have embraced and trusted our Savior one moment and rejected him and abandoned him to death the next. We continue to struggle with rejecting God in our daily lives and in our world, though we yearn to trust God. On this day of remembrance, we recognize that we have abandoned and rejected God. We have put our sin on Jesus and sent him to the cross to die alone. We enter this time of worship ready to confess where we have gone wrong and to put to death that which separates us from God's love so that we might have new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh my God, look loving mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We now hear God's holy word. The gospel reading is from John 18, verse 1, through chapter 19, verse 42. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, whom are you looking for? 
And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Melchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews it was better to have one person die for the Peter denies Jesus. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said. He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? And Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative to the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. A pilot went out to them and what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilot said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he would die. Then Pilate, at the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others ask you or did others tell you about me pilate replied i am not a jew am i your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me what have you done jesus answered 
My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you not, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and strike him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. But then on Pilate, from then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. He asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answers, answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them over to him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because this place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it 
but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what scripture said. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who, who had a first come to Jesus by night, a mixture and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus, wrapped it with the spice and linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord, let us respond, praise to you, O Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Lord Christ, on this day in which you gave up your life for the life of the world, we remember all the ways that you were broken and pierced. We remember all the ways that you were isolated and alone. We're aware of how those who absolutely fervently admitted that they would never 
leave you did just that, left you hiding behind rocks and tombs and trees so as not to be identified as a follower of you and your love. We come face to face today, O oh Christ, not just with your brokenness and your death, but also our own. Gracious Christ, in your great mercy and love, help us to know your presence. Help us to know your love. Help us to know your mercy. We thank you, Lord Christ, that on this day you died for the world. You died for the elderly, the sick, the broken. You died for the for those who are hospitalized. You died for those who are alone. You died for those who are afraid. You died for those who have sat in their houses for far too long, waiting for the germs, for the virus to relinquish. Gracious Christ, in your brokenness and in your death and in your descent to hell, set us free to rest finally and fully in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There is something about the story of Jesus' death that causes us not to want to listen too closely. I mean, Jesus goes through quite a lot on Monday, Thursday, when after he um, shared a meal with his disciples, washed their feet, was handed over, betrayed by one of his disciples, who sold Jesus for a mere little bit of money. Jesus then was taken away. And from that point until he is hanging on the cross, everything about who he was and what he was about was questioned. I mean, if the, if the experience of watching one disciple betray you with a kiss and another disciple promising to never leave you, do just that weren't enough to undo a person, then the very questions that Jesus is asked in this time of deep isolation, and it is an isolating thing, I suppose, when you are the savior of the world, when in fact the rest of the world didn't get the memo or got the memo, but didn't want to believe it or got the memo and wanted to ignore it, treating it instead as if it were fake news. Bit by bit, minute by minute, they sought to undo Jesus, first in his spirit and then his body, first in having a deep sense of who he was being dismantled, and then his body following suit at the hands of those whose job it was to crucify him, to put him on the cross. And if, and if um, insult 
were not enough to add to injury, Jesus did not have somebody carry his cross for him, but in fact, he carried his own cross to the very place where he was crucified. But just so that others who would pass by were um, clear about what was going on, this one is the king of the Jews, or this one says that he is the king of the Jews. There was an argument about what would be put on that cross as the reason for his death, the reason for his crucifixion, the reason that his body was broken, the reason that his side was pierced, the reason why a crown of thorns was put on his head, the reason people would walk by and mock him and jeer at him because they didn't understand. So we're, we're gathered to pay attention on this day for reasons that are not captured on too many greeting cards. Jesus was not only crucified, died, and was buried, but he was isolated. And he was questioned relentlessly, not so that there would be understanding, but so that there would be further grounds for um, his death. People would gossip about, gossip about him when they would walk on by. They were relentless. I wonder, though we see this story unfold before us and we see that Jesus is isolated and alone, I wonder, I wonder if Jesus ever gave that a moment's thought in the midst of everything that he was going through, or if his love, God's love that was poured in him and through him for us was the thing that kept him on the path. I suspect that it was, that it was love. But today we're not only able through Jesus' death to pay attention to the way that he died, but to pay attention as well to our own. And I suspect this is really why we have trouble with a day like Good Friday. Who wants to come face to face with the reality of our own death? Who wants to come face to face with our own failures? Who wants to come face to face with our own sin? Who wants to come face to face with our mortality and our humanity? Who wants to come face to face with the mountain of evidence in front of us about how, in fact, we have turned away. We have not listened. We try to run from God, from God, and we try our best to trust, and yet, in the cross, we see that that is not, in fact, what has happened. We have not trusted. Instead, with the uh, people who shouted, crucify him, we too take part in that reality. Or Jesus says, I am your Lord, and our response is, crucify him. And Jesus says, I love you. And we say, crucify him. And Jesus says, I see your brokenness. And instead of allowing ourselves to bask in the glow of God's grace and mercy, we shout, Crucify him. And Jesus says, I see your sin. Where Jesus wants to bring forgiveness, we say with Peter, I do not know that one. When 
when Jesus says, I see how you're isolated, we try to, to turn the tables to say, I do not know this one. Still, though we are fickle, and though we say one thing and do another, Jesus does not fall into that, into that way. For his way, his path is a way of love, a way of mercy and forgiveness for a world that has come undone, not just in the first century, but here and now, where everything is topsy-turvy. The coronavirus uh, gives us a chance to step aside, to step apart, to, to realize how broken, how broken, how in need we are of healing, of forgiveness, of salvation, because though we try to think otherwise, the hymn, How Great Thou Art, was not written about us. It was not, dear friends, written about us. It was not written about me, I will tell you that. Uh, I am not the savior of the world, but I sure am in need of a savior. In my own life, I will tell you that one of the things that I have wrestled with uh, probably my whole life, but really haven't been willing to come face to face with is a sense of anxiety, um, which uh, my dad had and his dad had and other relatives have had along the way. In the midst of this time, this time apart, as we walk together in the way of Jesus, as we follow him to the cross, as we gather under the cross with Mary and the other disciples, we hear God's promises in a whole new way. I love you. I forgive you. I have come to bring healing a new life. I have come so that you, you, dear disciples, are not alone in the feelings of failure and sadness and grief and loneliness and isolation and anger and anguish. You are not alone in any of this. For when Jesus dies on the cross, he identifies with all that we face. And his response is love. Whenever you wonder who the disciple is that Jesus loved, who stands next to Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and all the rest, where the, where the text says there was a disciple whom Jesus loved, I want you to say this. I am the disciple who Jesus loved loves. I am the one for whom Jesus dies. I am the one who Jesus has come to bring new life. I am the one whom Jesus forgives through his death. I am the one who Jesus heals because of his death. I am the one who Jesus loves. So I want you to carry that with you today in this otherwise somber, isolating sort of day. I mean, how many days have we been in our homes locked up? It feels like 5,000, but that might just be because I have a five-year-old at home. I mean, maybe some of the rest of you don't feel that way at all, but I will tell you that in my own experience, um, these days feel long. And I, what day is it in the week? I mean, it's a good thing we have a day called Good Friday, so that I know what day it is, or that yesterday was Monday, Thursday, or that in two days, we have a day where we can sing, God help us. Every morning is Easter morning from now on. Um, so that we have an, a point of orienting our lives. Because this does orient our lives. This story of Jesus who goes through all these things does orient and reorient us. It reorients us not around confusion and isolation and anguish and anger and anxiety. It, 
that reorients us around love, a love that is, that is um, high and is wide and encompasses the whole world, including you and me. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
My mouth is dried up like a posh art, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Your dogs are around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. My hands and feet have shriveled, and I can count my bones. They stared and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothes they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my sword, soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. I will tell you your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offsprings of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all of you offsprings of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction or the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but he heard when I cried to him. From you come my praises in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down, shall live in him. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. <laughs>